At each commencement, we ask a noteworthy individual to make remarks to our graduating class. This quarter, we are honored to have a world-renowned scholar speak to our graduates and guests. Dr. Eugenie C. Scott served on the faculties of the University of Kentucky and the University of Colorado before leaving traditional academia in 1986 to dedicate her professional life to the advancement of science literacy in the United States. She accepted the position of Executive Director of the National Center for Science Education, a nonprofit science education organization with members in every state. Since then, Dr. Scott has worked nationwide to communicate the scientific method to the general public and how to improve on how science is taught in the schools. Dr. Scott is frequently called upon by the print, radio, and television media as a spokesperson for the scientific view, especially when conflicts arise between scientific and pseudoscientific explanations. She's nationally recognized as a proponent of the separation of church and state and is a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion Committee an internationally recognized expert on the creation-evolution controversy. She's consulted with the National Academy of Sciences, several states' departments of education, and legal staffs in both the United States and Australia. Dr. Scott has been honored by scientific societies, educators, and community organizations, including the National Science Board, the American Society of Cell Biology, and the Geological Society of America. The California Science Teacher Association awarded her its Distinguished Service Award, and she has also been honored by the American Humanist Association, the Skeptics Society, and the Center for Inquiry. It is my very great privilege and honor to introduce Ohio State's Winter 2005 commencement speaker, Dr. Eugenia C. Scott. Thank you very much. Graduating seniors of Ohio State University, parents and families of graduates, friends of graduates, President Holbrook, Provost Snyder, members of the Board of Trustees, deans, administrators, and faculty, and other distinguished guests, thank you very much for inviting me to share your graduation. Uh, you'll notice the order in which I greeted you. Students, parents, and friends first, this is because you are the most important participants in this event. I say this because in June, I will be sitting in an audience watching our daughter graduate, and I know I will feel that the graduating students and their parents are for that day the center of the universe, and today so are you. So as I was writing this talk for your graduation, it crossed my mind that somewhere some man or woman was writing a commencement speech for our daughter Carrie's graduation. And I thought that perhaps I might get some inspiration for this talk by reflecting on what I would like our daughter to be told by her commencement speaker. She, like you, is graduating from a world-renowned university. She, like you, has just spent the last four years working hard, learning new things, improving her thinking, writing, reasoning, and other skills, being exposed to new ideas, having new experiences, some of which, which her mother is never going to know anything about, <laughs> probably kind of like your mom. She, like you, has had to make decisions and choices and live with the consequences. She, like you, has met new people, some of whom she liked, some of whom she didn't. You and she have spent four years growing, stretching, learning, thinking, and having fun. In her case, definitely, and I hope also the case for you. That is a tough act to follow. It seems terribly pretentious to think that I or Carrie's commencement speaker will be able to say anything to you that would stack up favorably against these last four years. So reflecting on Carrie's upcoming graduation left me at a loss for ideas of what to say to you. I asked some friends what they remembered about their college graduation ceremonies and none remembered their commencement speaker at all, unless she or he had done, so, done something really gauche. Now, my commencement speaker when I graduated from high school spent the entire time speaking into the cameras for a later broadcast. He didn't make eye contact with us at all. He was only concerned with who was going to be seeing him later. See ya. These people are who I'm going to talk to. 
So like a good ex-college professor, I did some research. You might not realize that if you Google commencement address, you get 162,000 hits. <laughs> I didn't read them all. But I read many that were just awful. And the good news for you is that I am not going to give an address on some thoughts on undergraduate education. It is, however, traditional at commencement to give the graduating seniors some words of wisdom. But I noticed that commencement addresses, on the contrary, often gave words of foolishness, like everything you know now will be wrong in 30 years, which is just plain dumb. 30 years from now, it will still be true that the Earth orbits the sun, that blood is composed of white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, and plasma, and that another kind of plasma is composed of ions, electrons, and neutral particles, that George Bernard Shaw got the title of arms and the man from Aram, Arma Wiram Kwakano, Troyaik we Primus Aboris, and that the opening lines of the Iliad are an example of iambic pentameter. Continents move on massive plates of rock, pushed by extrusions from the Earth's molten core. Lee surrendered to Grant rather than Grant surrendering to Lee. Science cannot tell you whether or not people have souls. And beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all ye know on Earth and all ye need to know. That and buy low, sell high. Of course, the world 30 years from now will be different from the world of today, but most of what you have learned in the last four years will remain true, even if modified by new insights and data. This is nowhere truer than in science, the conclusions of which, paradoxically, you can expect to change a lot, at least in the sense of being added to. 30 years ago, but who's counting? <laughs> I received my PhD in physical anthropology and began teaching at the University of Kentucky. I taught that the closest relatives to humans were the African apes. This is still taught today. I taught that archaeological records showed an exquisite evolution of stone tool types, ranging from crudely chipped river cobbles to symmetric ovate stones worked on all the edges to flint and obsidian blades and points carefully prepared with an eye not only to balance and utility, but also for color and texture of the underlying stone, tools that were not only functional but beautiful. I would teach the same thing today, only in more detail, because we know more about those tools now than we did 30 years ago. Anthropologists have learned from geologists how to use trace elements found in stone tools to figure out what rock deposits they came from. And we have learned that prehistoric people had trade routes extending some time for thousands of miles. 30 years ago, I taught that human beings evolved the ability to walk on two legs before they became habitual tool users, and that they were tool users before they developed big brains. This has not changed, although we have learned since then that simple tool use goes back in time a million years earlier than we thought when I began teaching. 30 years ago, it was still a viable hypothesis that the large Australopithecine man-apes might be males and the smaller ones females. That hypothesis has been disproved by the discovery of new fossils, the distribution of which in time and space make impossible that earlier hypothesis. We had the basic outlines 30 years ago, but new discoveries have helped us fill in a lot of details, uh, while allowing us to ask even more questions about the pattern of human evolution. Even in a field like human evolution that most people consider to be constantly changing, there is still plenty of continuity. So just because the world changes, you don't have to worry about your fine education at Ohio State becoming obsolete. So don't believe, you, believe it when people tell you that everything you know now will be wrong in 30 years. Now, there will be changes, much of it for the better. Only 30 years ago, after all, you could find whites-only signs in public drinking fountains. We're a lot better than we used to be, but we're still not perfect. And what our nation will be like 30 years from now depends on you. Will it be a kinder, more compassionate place? Will we preserve the beauty and fruitfulness of our country and the freedoms of our people? Will the opportunity for prosperity be shared? Internationally, will Pax Americana be spelled P-A-X or P-O-X? Will it Pretty soon it will be up to you and the decisions you make, because you're going to be running the show in another decade or so. You will be making the decisions that will shape not only your own lives, but also the communities you live in and the country itself. 
I want to talk a little bit about making decisions because it will be important that you make good ones. As a college graduate, and therefore an educated person and thinking person, you know that good decisions are based on evidence and logical inference, not opinion and prejudice, much less whim or fancy. That sounds good, but it's not easy. I'd say just about the hardest thing for anyone to do is to fairly evaluate evidence that, changes, that challenges one's ideologies, those beliefs that shape our actions. We all find it easier to embrace reinforcing our beliefs rather than to struggle to face what is true. Ideologies, however important to us, can lead us astray if they cause us to ignore empirical evidence, which means we have to bend over backwards to try to be as dispassionate as, as we can be to issues we hold dear. Does biology explain any of the behavioral differences between males and females? That's a tough one for a feminist. Are World Bank policies resulting in more economic misery? That's a tough one for a capitalist. Do basic principles of physics require the Earth to be billions of years old? That's a tough one for a biblical literalist. Are there some conditions under which clear-cutting a forest is beneficial to them? That's a tough one for an environmentalist. The physicist Richard Feynman once noted that science is a way of thinking that keeps you from fooling yourself. He could have been talking about critical thinking in general. A few years ago in a previous administration, an advisor to the president admitted that advice from scientists on a controversial issue was being ignored. He said, we know what they want to do, they'll only give us contrary advice. I don't think anyone believes that's the way to make good decisions. To keep from fooling yourself into believing that the arguments that reinforce your prejudices and ideologies are always sound, consider applying some of the rules we use in science, which aren't perfect, but which have managed to produce a lot of reliable knowledge about the natural world. When you're inclined to agree with an idea, always ask, is there another explanation? You will usually be able to think of one. And follow that question with, what's the best explanation? especially when the first explanation reinforces what you'd like to be true. To decide between ideas, see how they stack up against reality, which means weighing and logically analyzing evidence. Now I'm going to give you some advice because commencement addresses always give advice. What we need in America are critical thinkers who are willing to evaluate evidence, discard false information and sloppy thinking, and come up with thoughtful conclusions. Remember that in America, Everyone has a vote, whether you use your brains or not. My advice, if you're not going to use your brains, don't vote. We already have plenty of people who... <laughs> you never really know what an applause line is going to be. <laughs> We already have plenty of people who vote for a candidate for unthinking reasons. She's a woman, I'm gonna vote for her. He's a nice guy, the other one's a stuffed shirt, so I'm gonna vote for him. He's a famous movie star, so I'm sure he'd make a good governor. <laughs> okay, so I'm from California. Something you learned in your college courses is to do your homework. <laughs> you thought that was behind you, wrong. You're going to be doing homework all your life. It's practice for living. So do your homework when you're running this country in a few years. Keep asking, is there another explanation? And don't just go with the one that seems good enough. The most difficult thing to do is to keep looking for that better explanation. But that's what you have to do if you're going to be a critical thinker. Because in truth, what distinguishes an educated person like you is not just the amassing of information, which of course is going to change over time and some of you will contribute to that. But the acquisition of the skills of critical thinking, and that's something you can practice all your life. So that's the good advice part of this commencement address. Like everyone else who attends a university graduation, you will probably not remember it. What you will remember about this occasion, though, is the love, happiness, and pride of your families and friends in your accomplishments. And that, after all, is worth sitting through a commencement speech however pretentious such things are. Thank you for allowing me to be part of your ceremony. I am proud to join you as a fellow graduate of Ohio State University.